You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and this might be the last video I ever do on ESG. I know we're all excited about it. <laughs> I'm excited because people make my life absolutely miserable every time I do a video on ESG. They make threats, they cancel books, not a lot, but it's always there. The last time I talked about ESG, just a few days ago, the video was 26 minutes long. But then I was like, oh God, they always do the same shit. They always purposefully misconstrue what I say. I'm going to edit this down to where I'm basically just reading a news article and then I make like two or three bland statements. I edited 26 minutes down to seven minutes and I still got the same vitriol. So that whole day I was like, this is religious. This is not political. This is not economic. This is religious. It's as if I offended their religion by saying, I don't believe the dominant myths about ESG that are promulgated on YouTube. I don't, because I look into them. They say, if your company does not have a high ESG rating, you will not receive business loans. I look into that, it barely ever happens that anyone is denied loans because of a low ESG score, and in the rare instances where they are denied, they just get a loan from someone else. Then I hear, oh, if you're a CEO and you don't have a high ESG rating, then BlackRock, which holds a large block of stocks, will vote you out in the shareholders meeting. Except for I look into that and I can't find any instances of that happening. And like every single theory, I'll actually follow it down the rabbit hole and there's no rabbit down there. Now I do read the comments and I saw a few interesting comments. They said that the ESG theory is the best way to explain the dark matter of the culture war. Dark matter and dark energy are theories that say we are measuring the amount of matter in the universe and it doesn't make sense because there's not enough of it. So there must be dark matter, which is matter that exists, but we can't detect it. And if you add the matter we can detect, and then you add that plus the dark matter, that equals the total matter of the universe. And I was like, that's a reasonable thing to say. They're saying, this theory might not be perfect, but it's the best theory we have. And then I stumbled upon this TikTok by Vivek, I forget his last name. He's like 37, and I think he's about to run on the Republican ticket for president. And he was talking about ESG, but he was talking about ESG in relation to Occupy Wall Street. And he made this point, and ever since he said it, it's been like a splinter in my mind. But until this morning, I misremembered when Occupy Wall Street happened. I remembered it happening in like 2008 or 2009. But then I woke up this morning and I actually Googled, when did Occupy Wall Street happen? And it happened in the fall of 2011. Now this makes the timeline click together really well. So it goes like this. Occupy Wall Street starts up. It's a 59 day left wing populist movement against economic inequality and the influence of money in politics. And then you even see in self-described leftist websites Occupy Wall Street trained a generation in class warfare. Now people like to bring up stuff like Larry Fink from BlackRock saying, you have to force behaviors. And at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. What we're doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, your compensation could be impacted. But if you watch this entire clip, and it's only one minute, he's actually talking about the managers in BlackRock. He's not talking about the companies of the stock that they have as assets under management. One of the things I've always been confused by is why Antifa is on the side of the corporations. 
because you would think they would be battling them. But we literally live in a world where anarchists will be like, you're a racist if you don't like the latest Marvel movie. It's like, what do you care about this corporate product? And it's because we've all been played. So the ultra rich, they looked at Occupy Wall Street and they said, ooh, this shit is not good. Because it was extremely focused on economic inequality and the influence of money in politics. And they said, look, these plebs, these serfs, they're using the internet, they're organizing, then they show up and they are putting an incredible amount of pressure on us. So let's get them to do the same thing to everyone but us. So the focus, the energy, the drive of things like Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street got on board. They co-opted their attackers and they're like, yeah, power to the people. Let's keep this going. We love your energy and let's attack racial inequality and let's attack homophobia and let's attack and they list all these culture war topics and they completely shifted all of the energy away from economic inequality so people were saying like well why did this BlackRock guy say that they're gonna force behaviors because this appeals to anarchists and the far left they love that shit it's funny, in high school, I had this friend who was a punk, like an actual punk, punk rock punk. And so I started asking him, like, how do you become a punk? And then he spent the next 30 minutes telling me all of the rules it takes to becoming accepted as a punk by the other punks. There were so many rules to getting basically noticed by the group, accepted by the group on a temporary status, earning your membership, retaining your membership. There were more rules for being a punk than there are rules in the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. What I'm trying to say is an active duty soldier has less rules than someone in groups in the far left. So they love shit like this. They eat it up. That's why you got all these anarchists and all these Occupy Wall Street types Spending all day, every day, attacking people who say, you know, I don't think I'm going to see the next Marvel movie. It's like, what? There's a gay person. You're a homophobe. And they will just obsess for the next year. Because I've been in actual war. Initially, the culture war does look like an actual war. There's sides, there's battles, stuff like that. But over time, you realize it's just ongoing petty disputes, like neighbor disputes. This is my analogy for the culture war. A guy sitting in business class tricks two people in coach into fighting over a shared armrest forever. All of the energy of Occupy Wall Street was diverted into the culture war and away from economic inequality and the influence of money in politics, which actually scared the ultra rich. So even in this article where they talk about that was our boot camp that trained us for battle. But then you look at the actual things that they fought for, most of it is culture war stuff. The only stuff that is economic is like fight for $15, which was a fight to raise the minimum wage in cities that had a very high cost of living. Except for, if you actually read past the headline when this was happening, in those cities, almost no one was actually making minimum wage. Because if you make minimum wage, you literally have to live like an hour and a half away. So it behooved the local businesses to pay at least a bit above minimum wage. Not only the established minimum wage, but the new minimum wage of $15. So this shit did not bother the ultra rich at all. This was a fake economic fight. Meanwhile, 99% of the energy is based over stupid shit like Renaming sports teams. Oh shit, this was like 2011, 2012. Hey, you don't have gay marriage everywhere. Let's get gay marriage legal in every state. Okay, three years later. Okay, we got that. We're done. No, no, no. Did you know that trans people can't enlist in the military? And now every day, how small of a part of the population is trans people? Like one half of 1%? How often do we hear about their plight? Every single day. 
Economic inequality affects a much larger part of the population and it is almost never focused on. I'm telling you that codec from the end of Metal Gear Solid changed my life. Because one of the things I kept saying is how did Kojima predict our world right now 20 years ago? And it's because the evidence was there if you were paying attention. If you didn't let emotions control your mind for fucking everything. If you noticed economic inequality being focused on, and then Wall Street actually is like, right on, power to the people, let's fight against racism. Also, let's get gays to marry. It's like, okay, that's not related to economic inequality at all. You just completely shifted the course of a mighty river away from your subdivision to flood everyone else's this is real life James Bond villain shit happening. And all the evidence is there, but oh shit, did you know that there was a trans person in a Starbucks ad in India? Let's talk about that for a week. Okay, we're done talking about that. Oh, did you know that three years ago Ford in Europe painted a truck in gay pride colors? Let's talk about that for a week. Let's continually be distracted by culture war bullshit. Here's the other thing about the ultra rich right now. You can go back in history and read about kings. And you say, oh, a king must have had the most power that anyone has ever had in history. Go read about the actual lives of kings. You are constantly almost being assassinated. You have to worry about the barons. You have to get them on your side. You have to worry about the peasants. You have to worry about other countries. You have to marry your daughter off to your enemy to prevent a war. They're always on the verge of bankruptcy. They're always cutting these deals. They're living in these freezing cold, damp castles where people piss in the hallway. That's where people pissed. That's like the number one question when you go on these tours. Where do people go to the bathroom? Oh, well, you know, no, they pissed in the freaking corner. They pissed in the corner or they pissed in the hallway. So after a long day in a freezing cold, damp castle, you walk back to your bedroom and hope not to get assassinated by one of your barons or vassals. And all you're smelling is all of the piss and shit from everyone who had visited the castle that day. But the lives of the ultra-rich right now are of luxury and comfort that has never existed. The pharaohs did not have the level of comfort that Larry Fink from BlackRock has. Do you think he really gives a fuck about how many black lesbians are managers in marketing at some company who stocks his company buy in bulk? He doesn't give a fuck. All he wants, besides to amass billions, is to keep regular people from doing something like this again. From ever focusing on economic inequality and the influence of money in politics again. And do you know what? Do you know that there's some gay t-shirts at Target? Let's talk about that for the next month, and then we'll focus on economic inequality. What? Something new happened? What did Garth Brooks say? Oh, I don't like him. We all got played. Everyone on every side of the culture war got played by the ultra-rich who saw Occupy Wall Street, they saw the internet being used, to organize movements, and they said, let's steer this river away from us, let's support it, and it will also get the left wing off our back. Think about how many anarchists are obsessed with Marvel movies, which have devolved into shitty product. They will literally call you a white supremacist if you don't want to go see the Marvels. Think about how insane that is. But yeah, when I originally misremembered Occupy Wall Street as happening in like 2008, 2009, I was like, that doesn't quite really connect because all of this culture war stuff, it happened like about 10 years ago. But then when I saw that it was 2011, because one question I always like to ask people is, what was the last year where things felt kind of normal? And it was 2012 because this plan was just starting. All of the movies, TV, music, you were enjoying was most likely recorded in 2011 before things all got crazy. And what you'll see is 
2012 to 2015, there will be a ramp up. And then in 2015, there is an absolute explosion. What else happened in 2015? Gay marriage was made legal in all of the United States, which took away a major part of the culture war. That was a major conflagration. And it was basically over. If you were for gay marriage, if you were against gay marriage, it was basically a done deal. Oh shit, what are we going to do with these people? They might circle back to economic inequality. No, let's get them to fight over a shitty armrest in coach for the rest of their lives. So what do you do when you feel like you're getting caught up in some sort of culture war, which is pushing all the right buttons for your emotions? You say, let me go check my investment portfolio. Let me go check my bank account. How my stack's doing? This is a real life James Bond villain plan that is totally working. It's not your fault. You didn't create it. But now that you know, adjust accordingly. Before I go, First Kill Graphic Novel link is in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.